Two fathers, two sons, <coughs> three people, three cars. Everybody's happy. I pleased everybody. That's how. How do you sit still? Gareth, you are the last person in the world to give anybody that sort of advice. I'm not talking and about fidget. me, Fred. No, Gail, I'm talking about these things. Satellites, communication satellites, the type which bring us satellite television and phone communications. Mm. Now, satellites, as you know, whiz around the Earth, and the speed at which they orbit the Earth is very important. If the satellite is going too fast, it will fly off into deep space and we'll lose it forever. Bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. If the satellite's going too slow, it will spiral in and tumble and break up as it hits the Earth. Bit of a problem too. But there's another problem with satellites that move. What if you're on the Earth with a satellite dish trying to point it at a moving satellite? What happens? Well, keep whizzing round, yeah, you'd never find it. It would just pass overhead. Oh yes, and there's something else as well. Not more problems. You see, the Earth itself is rotating. Now, the speed at which a satellite orbits the Earth is determined by the height of that orbit. And at the right speed, your satellite should orbit the Earth once every 24 hours. And I'm going to have a go to get my radio control satellite here to follow this orbit around the Earth. Here we go. Watch what happens. Now, you can see that the satellite seems to hover over the same point on the Earth. And if you're watching from Earth, that would appear that the satellite hovered in the same position in the sky, which is very, very handy if you're trying to point a dish at it. Now, because the speed a satellite goes at is determined by its height, all satellites which hover over the same spot have to occupy the same orbit. Now, they're called geostationary satellites, and it's getting pretty crowded up there at the height of 35,900 kilometers. So, how do you sit still? Well, a satellite does it at 35,900 kilometres up, and it's going at 11,000 kilometres per hour. That's how. Fascinating. How much sun do you need to live? As much as you can possibly get, as far as I'm concerned. That's why you've mate. always got that healthy, that healthy glow, glow, isn't it? Actually, all living creatures on Earth need sunlight to exist, even if it's only indirectly. That's what you'd think, Gareth, but you'd be wrong. And that'd be a first. Come on, we're going for a dip. <laughs> a dip? Come on. <gasps> Never done that before. Gail, it's getting very dark and cold down here. That's because we're now two and a half kilometres below the surface of the water and no sun can get down here at all. But with a bit of luck, we might see a monster. Monster? <laughs> oh, it's a bit dark and cold now, girl. I don't believe any monsters could live down here. Oh, come over here. It should warm up a bit. <sighs> Oh, it is warming up. Oh, yeah. Can you feel it? In fact, it's nearly now 30 degrees Celsius. Wow. And with a bit of luck, we should experience an enormous eruption of gas. Oh. Sorry about that, Kale. I had a curry for breakfast. Just for once, Gareth, it wasn't actually you. It came from this vent here in the seabed. This is a hole in the Earth's crust, and it's a bit like an underwater volcano. It spews out molten rock, and when that rock hits the sea, it produces huge clouds of steam and chemicals and gases. Come over here and have a look at this. Now, you wouldn't believe it, but there's a whole community of life forms that live off these gases. What are they, plants? Well, no, these, you would think they were plants, but they're actually animals. They are giant tube worms. Tube worms? Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, it is only a model, Gary. Oh. But it is, in fact, a life-size model. What? Now, they're called Riftia pacatila, and they truly are monsters of the deep. Now, the oxygen and hydrogen sulphide that comes out of the vent feeds bacteria which live inside the worm, and then the worm, in turn, feeds on those bacteria. So, how much sunlight do you need to stay alive? None at all if you're a Riftia pacatila. Fascinating, Gail. But I've got to go. I've got to swim back to the table. Oh, right. Off you go, then. Gareth, we're not really underwater, you know. How can you make a Super Bowl? Well, you can make it to the Super Bowl by playing American football like the San Francisco 49ers. Gareth, not that kind of Super Bowl. Oh. Look, here's a potato, common or garden, ordinary spud. What use is it? Well, eating, obviously. Oh, yeah, eating and also... 
printing. Oh, yes. Remember? Yeah, yeah. A little bit yeah. 90s, a little bit passe, quite effective, but we move on. And now, the modern vogue is fruit printing. Mm. An apple in half, OK? We're going to go green on this one, I think, aren't we? That's a good colour for an apple. Yes, a yeah. good colour for an apple. In half, so you get the natural shape of the apple. A good paint all over it. Yes. And print it. And there we are. That's very good, Fred, but what a about the Super Bowl? A beautiful fruit print. I'm coming to the Super Bowl, very Gareth. Nice. And you can do the same with an orange. Get the natural segments. OK, so we're going to go orange on this time. OK, across the segments, round the edge. Be this creative, is fruit printing, Fred. and this is very much the modern thing to be doing. OK, that says orange to me. Yes, you can move yes. on to all sorts of exotic fruit, pomegranates, mm -hmm. star fruit, any kind of fruit virtually that you want. What use is it? I know you're dying to ask. Well, you can cover your books in these wonderful oh, yeah. fruit prints. OK, not but only what that. What about the Super Bowl? I'm coming to that. Not only that, present bags as well. Very nice. Now, the Super Bowl, I know you're dying to ask me about that. <laughs> now, there's a bowl made out of papier-mâché. Not exactly a Super Bowl, Not is a it? Super Bowl. But it friend. will be when you glue your lovely oh, fruit prints yes. onto it and then varnish the whole thing so that you are left with a bowl which looks exactly oh. like that. Now, that's a Super now, Bowl. Now, that is. is a Super Bowl for putting your fruit or anything else in. Or if you don't fancy fruit, it's also a super hat. Oh, it's you, Fred. That's me to a T, isn't it? And that's how you make a Super Bowl. Super Bowl bad hat, Fred. <laughs> how can you eat a horse? No, you, you don't eat a horse. Just an expression. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. It's you don't actually again, eat a horse. It, yeah. Especially you, because you're a vegetarian. Exactly. In fact, the story I'm about to tell you is the most convincing argument for vegetarianism I have ever encountered. You see, early in the 19th century, one of the great problems occupying all the great thinkers of the time was how to feed the rapidly increasing population of planet Earth. And along came a mildly eccentric scientist by the name of Dr. William Buckland. How do? I'm Dr. William Buckland, gastronaut extraordinaire. You name it. I've eaten it. I wonder what the chef has prepared for me today. Garçon! Ah, oh, yes, monsieur. Today for you we have the boiled elephant trunk or the rhinoceros pie. Oh, absolutely smashing. If you don't mind, though, I'll start with a shoe. Very well, sir. <laughs> you see, Dr Buckland reasoned that what the world needed was a new type of food. Something that was easy to raise and very tasty. But, being as nobody knew what was edible and what wasn't, Dr. Buckland decided to eat his way through the animal kingdom and find out for himself. Here oh. we are, monsieur. <laughs> the soup of the Thank you very much indeed. Uh, waiter, uh, there is a fly in my soup. But of course, uh, it's cream of blue bottle. Oh, disgusting. If you don't mind, I'll just settle for the main course today. Blue oh. soup. Oh. All right, you are, sir. What's Here this? we are. We have the wonderful deep fried mouse in butter on. Oh, no, that's better. I bet it's nice and crunchy as well. I like my food crunchy, and I bet this tastes a lot better than that awful mole that I had to eat yesterday. Now, mole has to be the single vilest meat on the planet. It's all gristly and full of grit. Oh, no, 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 foul, foul. Well, that's enough for now. I think I'll move on to the next course. Here's your cock, monsieur. Oh, that, now, this is going to be a real treat. Kansas deep fried crocodile. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Definitely tastes quite like chicken, actually. Now, William Buckland and his son, Frank, continued their quest to eat their way through the entire animal kingdom. They never did actually find this new superfood, but they did confirm once and for all that blue bottle soup truly is disgusting. So, how do you eat a horse? Well, personally, I'd rather not, but I'm sure Dr Buckland and his son quite enjoyed it. Now, for you, sir, we have the pièce de résistance, toad in the hole. Oh. How spiky 
is liquid. Uh, Fred, liquids aren't known for being spiky. I mean, they have nice runny fluids. I'm going to prove you wrong in a moment. But first of all, take a look at this. You've seen this before, haven't you? Iron filings on, oh, a, yeah. on a piece of card yeah. held over a magnet, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Now, let's see what happens. Oh, oh that's hey, spiky. That's pretty spiky, isn't it? Yeah. But of course, it's not a liquid, though, is it? Not at all, no. But would you agree with me that this is a liquid? That's definitely I mean, it's yeah. oil in a bowl, isn't it? Yeah, it's a liquid. Yeah. So if we hold that over the magnet... <gasps> wow. Oh, wow. wow. That's weird. Now What's that? Now that is spiky, isn't it? No, it's like very spiky. Monster. Thousands of tiny particles of iron in the oil, uh -huh. and the moment you hold it above the magnet, that's what you get. They call it magnetic liquid or a ferrofluid. And they actually use it to stop things vibrating or to seal things. Good, isn't it? It's very good. Yeah. So I'll just take that away and we'll watch this one now, which is the same thing, the same material, except it's in this tube of water. Now watch what happens. <gasps> oh, hey. that's spiky. Is that spiky? Yeah. And is that spiky? Oh, that's that's cool. fantastically so spiky. So how spiky is liquid? Well, if it's a ferrofluid and there's a magnet around, very spiky oh, indeed. Fantastic. How come you wait for ages and then three come along at once? Hey, I know what you're talking about. Buses. I know, it drives us all mad yes. and we all tend to blame the bus companies. Yeah, but believe it. it or not, no matter how tight their schedule is, it wouldn't make any difference. It's just the way of the world. Rubbish. I'm absolutely serious. Grab your hats. We're on the buses. Lovely. Oh. So here we are at the bus depot. Now, driver number one, Fred, is going to take his leave and off he goes to pick up the people at the bus stop who've been waiting there for ages in the pouring rain. Meanwhile, driver number two, Gareth, waits his turn in the bus garage. And by the time Fred gets to the first bus stop and collects all, all those people, then the it's right just ready. about time for Gareth to fold up his newspaper right, off go then. and set Even off on the here. journey. <laughs> now, of course, the thing is, by the time Gareth gets to this bus stop, Fred's already picked everyone up. And Gareth is just there to pick up a couple of stragglers who missed the first <laughs> bus. So he's away much faster than Fred was, because obviously there aren't as many people to get on or off. Have the right change ready. Now Fred's collected everyone from the second bus stop. Gareth is just in time to pick up a woman who missed the first bus. There we go, Gareth. And he's making good time on Fred. You see, by the time Fred's there to pick up everyone from the third bus stop, Gareth is right behind him. And the strange thing is, the more buses you actually add to the schedule, Schedule, the worse the bunching problem. Sometimes, if the route's long enough, you might even get as many as three buses bunching up together. Get him, move on. So that's how come you wait for ages and three come along at once. And that's how for now. Ron. Cheers, guys. Now then, the question for win on the box is what colour stripes did Gareth have on his shirt? Ah, oh, the number's on the screen. It's our usual one, but please ask permission and dial very, very carefully. You know what, David? We just love to hear from these guys. Oh, yes.